Well, good afternoon, Soul Refiner family. It's so good to see everybody here. Um, we are having a few technical difficulties with our guests right now, so we will continue on uh, with the beginning portion of this. It is so good to see all the participants flowing in. I think we're well above 35 right now. Um, but before we keep going, I just want to introduce someone here. You, you probably are familiar uh, with his smiling face. Uh, this is Marcos, and he is the newest member of the Soul Refiner Staffer family. How's it going, guys? So he is our brand new director of content. Uh, we are so excited to have him on board, and I, I look forward to uh, hosting this event with him. So, thank you. Well, folks, it is Easter season. Um, Resurrection Sunday is only nine days away. Easily, this is my favorite spiritual uh, holiday, my, really, my favorite time of the year, period. It changed history and it changed my story forever. Um, I just can't wait to get going here. So, as people are coming in, I really want uh, on the chat for folks to just talk about what are some of their traditions? What are some of the things they're looking forward to uh, as we go through this coming Palm Sunday, as we roll into Resurrection Sunday, uh, Good Friday, Easter weekend? You know, what are some of the things you're looking forward to? I know for some folks, it'll be the first time you've had anything other than fish for protein over the last seven weeks. Hey, I'd love to hear about that. Send it on. You know how much we love to talk about food here. Um, but regardless of what, what you've been doing here for Lent, um, if anything, whether you gave something up or whether you're undertaking some kind of new uh, piece to your faith, uh, all of us are under the grace provided uh, by our Savior some 2,000 years ago uh, from the finished work on the cross. Uh, and that's what I really want to stay focused on in my family. Um, I, I'm already seeing some of the answers roll in. And so, Marcos, what about you, man? What are you thinking uh, for this holiday season, you know, it, this whole transition for you from uh, the corporate sector over now to to soul refiner uh, how is this one going to be different for you no absolutely i think one word that comes to mind is just gratitude you know not only just for the season for what christ has done for us but just for this opportunity to be here serving with this ministry uh for not only all that they have already accomplished but what the direction that we're heading in and to be a part of that is just something i'm immensely grateful for uh privileged and honored humbled by and so also looking forward to being back with family. Obviously, we relocated here, so it's a bit of a transition for us. So as we head into Easter, uh, being back with family, we usually kind of spend together uh, the weekends. And so we'll be doing that. Right. Fantastic, man. Thank you so much. And um, I'm probably going to step away here for a second just to go and take care of some, some technical stuff. Uh, Marcos is going to wind up honcho in the meeting here. Um, so with that said, Marcos, if you don't mind opening us up in some prayer, and then hopefully I'm back in time to give us th get us through some housekeeping, um, but we are just working to get our, our guests in here. So, excuse me. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, Father, we thank you guys so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to be able to discuss your word, to be able to testify of your goodness and your mercy, uh, that you are a redeeming God, a God that reconciles. We are thankful, Lord, for the hope, for the guests that we're going to have on today. Hopefully we can get them on here soon and uh, hear of all that you've done in his life uh, to redeem it and to see the impact it's now having for your kingdom. Thank you for preparing the hearts and minds of all the men in attendance today. Thank you for gathering them here, for giving them hope, for instilling your truth into them, Lord, and for bringing hope for a, a future that's bright, uh, full of freedom, Lord, and, and your plans and purposes that are good for them. Father, I hope that whatever is discussed here today, that it sows deep into the hearts of these men, that it bears fruit in their lives, and that, Lord, that they themselves can testify of your goodness as well in the days and weeks to come, and that they can be life changers as well for the kingdom to impact other lives as well. Father, we just extend gratitude right now in this time, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Marcos. All right, guys, let's take care of a little bit of housekeeping as we go ahead and kick this thing off. I think that uh, we are squared away with our guest. He should be coming in momentarily. Um, please don't forget the chat box is super important in this. Uh, some, some men actually come for the chat and they pick up the recording later on, uh, either on the Facebook site or in our uh, Amazon Music podcast uh, stash. Uh, maybe it's over in Spotify where you find it. But the chat for some guys is the main attraction for the live session, and I couldn't agree with you, with them more. Uh, there's so much healing to be had there, and if you're hurt, man, we want to hear about that too. Put that in there. It doesn't have to be just all flowers and sunshine and puppy kisses. Okay, if you're hurting, 
this is the place to bring it. This is a place to drop it off, to talk about it with the other guys. Get in the middle of the herd here. Um, any prayer requests you need, additional insights you may be seeking, whatever that looks like. Q&A, we'll also pull those from the chat. We've got a couple of folks in the back that are, are manning the question and answers from the chat. You can also put that in the Q&A you see at the bottom of your screen as you go through this. Um, if we don't get to your question during the webinar, don't worry. We, get, we go ahead and we go through all those and we send out replies. So a very straightforward. Yep, absolutely. And men, I also wanted to send a reminder to you that us as men will be meeting every second Friday of each month at 1 p.m. And for the uh, women as well, they also meet on the second Friday of each month. They will be meeting at 10 a.m. and their group is called the Sanctuary. In fact, this week they covered triggers. So if your wife missed it, uh, be sure to have them check out one of our recordings on Soul Refiner's Facebook page and invite them to come join next month. We can't stress enough how important it is to have your wives also be a part of the healing journey. Uh, because if they're not equipped with resources, which is a key step in this process, they may lag behind you in your recovery. All right, team. Um, what I want to do before our, our guest gets in um, is just open up kind of a, a basic Q&A question as we go lead into this. Uh, some disclaimers here before our guest comes. Uh, I do want everybody uh, to recognize that this is not some place to bring morbid curiosity today. Uh, this is not some place to bring some kind of sordid uh, mentality of I want to get some behind the scenes on the porn industry. Um, if you're looking for that, you're in the wrong place. Just please go ahead and end the meeting for yourself, and, and then we can talk about it in some other time. Everybody should be getting all the emails from me, so you know where to reach me. Um, this is a place to talk about what Christ is doing in men's lives, uh, whereas before it was completely broken, untenable, no future forward, no way with, uh, ahead with a family, uh, and really no way ahead personally. Um, but God, rich in mercy. That's what this meeting's all about. Um, we're not going to be talking about the finer points of the adult entertainment industry. Uh, so for anybody that might have had some kind of hopes for that, even subconscious ones, uh, I apologize in advance, but this is really going to be a feel-good story. So uh, excuse me really fast. I'm going to wait uh, and go ahead and take a look for our, our guest, and Marcus is going to start fielding some of the Q&A questions. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, so like Lamar said, guys, if you have any Q&A, any questions that you guys maybe wanted to ask of our guest speaker, Joshua, go ahead and start putting them in a the chat box there. We'll do our best to pick a couple out to address them. We do have a couple questions lined up here. Um, some of them may match yours, uh, so don't feel too bad. You know, if we don't necessarily highlight yours, we'll try to do our best to try to tackle some of the biggest questions uh, that some guys may be wondering and seeking answers to. So anything that you guys can think of uh, may not necessarily be geared or directed towards our guest speaker, but just anything that you feel that you need help with in whatever area, uh, go ahead and start typing away in a chat box. And uh, also, we, we appreciate your prayers. Thank you. Uh, always covet those. And hopefully we can uh, fix our technical difficulties here. Thank you guys for your patience and for always consistently uh, following us and, and uh, being a part of the webinar. We hope it's a blessing to you guys. Uh, so let's see what we got. Uh, let's see. All right. Okay. Let's see if we can find some questions here for you guys. And it looks like our guest has just come on. Welcome, my brother, welcome. So good to see you, my friend. Can you hear us okay? Yeah. All right, now we can hear you. Cool. There we go. I, I, I tell you what, um, Joshua, as, as much as I would love for someone as, as handsome as you to be named Lamar, uh, somehow, Zoom has taken my name and tagged it over on you. I don't know if you can rename that or something, but uh, for all stations out there, that is not the real Lamar. Uh, that is a much younger version. Uh, yeah, just way more, better put together. So uh, that's actually Joshua over there, everybody. So how you doing, man? Good. Uh, it has been a 
Friday for me is just nuts, but I'm great. Couldn't be better. Oh, I'm man. Lamar. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We're so thankful you're here, man. So um, everybody here knows uh, they've seen the invitations go out that you're a former adult entertainment guy. I mean, slash porn star, you know, just calling it what it is. Now you're a pastor. And so I, I just want to give you you know, the opportunity, man, as we go through and just what is God doing in your life right now? And then we'll get to the other stuff here in a bit. Yeah. Um, really, really neat. Um, I'm, I'm getting the opportunity to travel and, uh, teach and preach. And, um, there's this quote. So I went, I went to school, still going to school, um, pursuing my master's in theology, but, um, one of the classes that I took along the way, from uh, in, in apologetics, um, Nabil Karishi, he was someone that I, I just like really connected with. And he said that I would love not to tell my story anymore regarding like him, him, you know, previously being a Muslim. I would love to not tell my story anymore. But ultimately, um, as long as there are still Muslims, I have, you know, the, the honor and the privilege to continue sharing my story with a with a specific compassion. And, and, and it is my joy to do that to benefit the body of Christ. So I, I kind of cling on that as well, where it's like, um, I love sharing my story, but there are seasons where it's like, man, uh, is, is this the lane that I'm going to live in forever? And, and God has been kind of humbling me in that sense where it's like, uh, well, well, number one, it's, it's not your story, it's mine. And uh, yet, and yes, like very Genesis 50, 20, where where God has positioned me and redirected the influence that I had and pointed it, pointed it right back at where I got it. And uh, it, it's a neat season for that. But what God is doing in my life is uh, humbling me each day as a father. And it's like, I, I never thought I would be a father because I never had a father. And I thought that you needed to see something, um, you know, you, need, you needed an example to be able to execute something. And it's just God has taught me so much through being a parent. Um, when my when my son was born, when my when my first son was born, we had this moment where I walk over and you know they just wiped him off and all that stuff and and, and the nurse was like you can touch him, and I I reached toward him and he grabbed my finger, and man I just lost it because in that moment I tangibly felt the presence of God and wow. just like man. Uh, as much as you love, uh, his name is Cannon. As much as you love uh, your son, I love you so much more. Wow. wow. Yes. So, I mean, just just that, man. Just the I, I'm honored that I get to do what I do for a living. And um, yeah, so that's that's what God is doing in my life right now. And that's powerful as you share that. I, I think of Paul's story and his thorn in the flesh and how he, you know, brings that up to God, like, Lord, deliver me of this. And we don't, no one really knows whatever that thorn was, but to each walk in their own individual journey, we can probably attest to whatever that thorn may be for us. And God's response is that his grace is sufficient for us, right? Yeah. And uh, Paul speaks about, you know, boasting all the more about his weaknesses so the power of God can rest upon him. And uh, again, to fulfill his purpose for the kingdom and bring others into the kingdom to bring healing reconciliation to others. So, man, thank you so much for continuing on this track and for sharing your story. Uh, we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Joshua, man, tell us a little bit about your faith upbringing, if there was any, and then how that took you to California. Um, and then how did you get roped into the adult entertainment industry? Yeah, so I grew up in um, in South Carolina, so in in the middle of the Bible Belt. So I went to church on Wednesday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, vacation Bible school. You know, I, I was I was I was at vacation Bible school more so for the the ice cream sandwiches and the Kool Aid, but um, I, I was there. You know, I was there, and I I I believed that there was a God, and I believed that He created everything. But the disconnect was. Um, so me having the personality of a high achiever and me not having a father, the gap was what's wrong with me and my person, my personality as an achiever, I tried to achieve momentary, you know, in, uh, you know, achievements to cover up the, the, the thought behind, well, number one, I really don't know who I am. 
Um, I, I don't know exactly what's wrong with me. Like what, why, like, don't I have a dad and that personality type, you know, through scholastics or sports or, you know, it turned into, you know, getting the girl that no one else could, um, it, that mindset, it, that momentary happiness filled the, the, the void that was, that was pain. And that can just continue throughout my life. But, you know, ultimately I knew a lot about God. My grandparents loved Jesus. Um, we, you know, they absolutely were believers. My mom, um, it was like, it's hard to say, you know, it's like, it's hard to say like when her faith journey, like authentically started, but I mean, she was in the same boat. Like she, we went to church. Um, it wasn't like a, a large part of our, of our life, but it was, you know, we, we prayed and went to church and we're in community to some capacity. But as I got older, I got more and more disconnected from that. But we can, we can wrap back around like with my mom, because there's a really neat, um, what happens, what eventually happens. But, um, just, so that was my upbringing regarding faith. Um, and then, so if you would have asked me if I was a, a Christian, I would have said yes, to, to be clear though. I was not because I thought, do I believe in God? Yes. Is God real? You know, and it, did he create everything? Yes. But that's where it stopped, you know, and, and, and John 14, six tells us that, you know, that's not it. And, um, so I grew up acting and modeling. I started doing that when I was about 14 or 15, had a lot of success, went to college, studied theater. Um, and I thought, okay, you know, it's been a few years. I'm doing pretty good. If I put myself in closer proximity to the industry that I want to be a part of, it would make sense for my career to, you know, take off. That would be advantageous for me. So I moved to Hollywood, got an agent in modeling, got an agent in acting. Um, all along the way, I always had more success modeling than acting, even though I wanted to be the other way around. That's just sometimes that's how it works. And um, like, I, and that's all I wanted to do. And then like many people who live in Hollywood, it's like, I'm pursuing this, but I'm doing this to pay my bills. So I found myself working in a restaurant. And in that restaurant, four girls came up to me and said, hey, do you want to um, be in the porn industry? And I was like, the what? <laughs> you know, it's like, because for, for me, I had seen pornography before, but it, it wasn't real in, in a sense where it's like, you know, the first time that my, you know, we took our kids to Disney World, he saw Mickey and he freaked out because he wasn't on a screen. You know, it was too much. So this fantasy became real. And they invited me into their world. And there was, you know, two factors at play, this, uh, this overwhelming curiosity and this gut feeling where it's like, I shouldn't do that. I definitely shouldn't do that. And then they invited me to meet their, their agent. And these agents are master manipulators. And he asked me, how, how did you grow up? Why are you here? What do you want to accomplish? I grew up with, you know, just, just me and my mom. Um, I, I, I want to be famous, you know, I'm, I'm out here like to be an actor and I want to be famous like that. That's why that, and those are the, and those questions like, well, um, the industry, you know, you, you could be famous. You're a good looking guy. There's not a lot of good looking guys in the industry. Um, you have acting experience and actually the industry is kind of shifting where they're making major films, they're parroting movies. And that would be really, you know, it'd be a, to your advantage that you have this acting ability and like, man, you could be a star. You can make all this money. You can travel the world. You can do all this stuff. And I heard uh, a, a very, uh, a poor man's version or a, a counterfeit version of my dream because it, it had some alignment, but mm. with a lot of compromise. Right. And in, in, in that moment, I'm thinking, well, you know, so much self-doubt, like self-doubt and um, just like, uh, like really questioning my worth was something regardless of how I was doing on the outside, it was always something that was questioning myself. And I was asking myself, well, maybe this is close as I'll get. Maybe this is, this is as good as it's going to get for me because maybe I'm just not good enough because I keep auditioning for stuff and I get, you know, I get close, but I don't make it. And then I get this modeling job that I really don't want to do um, because I just want to be, you know, I just want to be an actor. This is just what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'll just do one. And that decision to compromise and, the, and that decision to do one, while I thought, okay, it's not going to be a big deal, it immediately 
changed everything about my life because once I did one, what I didn't know, it was for a very large production company and it was a large production and it, it got reeled out relatively quickly. So within two weeks, this is everywhere. And then what I didn't know is when you sign a contract, you get paid once, but they can compromise that content and sell it to third and third and, you know, second and third parties over and over and over again. So all of a sudden I, you know, this movie's on the internet and um, I'm on the cover of a, a well-known magazine that's all over the place. So very quickly, my agent is calling me, you, you've compromised your contract, you're fired, acting, modeling, you're fired, you're fired. My mom finds out through the grapevine, you know, small town, in South Carolina. Um, hey, Joshua Luke, you want, you know, Joshua Luke, you know, that means you're in trouble in the South if you, you hear your middle name, you know, um, so... Um, and I'm having this conversation with my mom and it was heartbreaking because she was not, she was not like, I'm mad at you. Um, you know, I, it was, why would you do that? Because you're so much, there's so much inside of you. You, you're like, you have so much potential and it just breaks my heart that everything that you worked for, for a decade just went up in smoke. Like, why would you do that? And, and, and that was like, that narrative never changed. Like my mom was relentless in that. Like you shouldn't be doing this. You're so much better than that. You're so much more valuable than that. And it, like in in retrospect, just like knowing that. I mean that that prevented me from making like worse decisions in regard to like self harm because it would be it'd have been really easy for me to not to believe that anyone cared about me. And even though this person that I rejected to the point that I wasn't even answering her calls or text, that nothing stopped her from pursuing me. Wow. That's amazing, man. That's powerful. Um, I wonder how much that, that was obviously a clear def, uh, defining difference maker for you in that journey and kind of giving you that one gleam of hope of your true identity of yourself, you know, almost like the father calling out to you, like, that's not who you are. You know, this is who you are. Just that affirmation, man. That's incredible. I mean, once you initially went down that road, um, were there initial feelings of guilt and shame? And did those feelings ever subside as you went deeper down that path? Yeah, so um, yes and yes. So, you know, from the jump, from the beginning, it's like, I knew that, I knew I wasn't doing a good thing. And, and everyone has this, um, you know, desire that God places inside of them that you want to, you know, you want to contribute, you know, you know, that, that, that Hebrew word, Rada, like we're called to rule and reign. We're called to help, you know, take partner in, um, you know, Jesus' objective in redeeming the world. And so like that, that lies dormant in everyone. So that, that desire to, to matter was there. Um, but, but that voice got really quiet, the more, uh, more films that I did. So I, I felt an initial shame and, then it just become so monotonous that I was just numb to it. Mm. And, you know, it, and it was tough because like Joshua just eventually stopped existing outside of doing my taxes. You know, I, I didn't exist. You're like, like a shell I, of yourself almost basically. Well, it, that and like literally, you know, uh, you know, just, just to make light of it, but just like, you know, I was a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude, you know, like <laughs> Tropic Thunder, like, like, right. you know, because I mean, that's, but, but like truly like that's what, because I was, I went by a stage name that everyone knew me as, and I, like, I surrendered, like, I could have said, no, this is my name, but I, I didn't do that. Um, so everyone, I, everywhere I went, everyone knew who I was, like, you know, by like 2010, 2011, you know, I'm, I'm, if, if I'm not the most famous, like male porn star in the world, it's like, I'm, I'm top five, you know, everyone knows who I am. Um, and for some reason, like it being in LA and in Vegas often, uh, I don't know if it's just because like the, the magnitude of the depravity or, or what, but like everywhere I went, like everywhere I went, people knew who I was. And so people like, you know, at the gym that I went to, where I got my haircut, like things like that, like that's what they called me. They called me by my stage name. I allowed it and it never changed. So as I pushed out everyone that I had authentic relationships with, because if, if you really know me, I'm accountable to you in some capacity. Yeah. So 
you know, like Genesis two to three, it's like, you know, Adam and Eve, they're naked, they're walking, there was no shame. And all of a sudden sin enters the picture and we're hiding from God and we're covering up because I, I don't want anyone to see that I'm naked. So it's like, I felt ashamed and guilty. So I hid myself from everyone that mattered, everyone that truly mattered in my life, because I didn't want to look them in the eye because that was the only way that I could get up and do what I was doing each and every day because no one was holding me accountable. No one was saying, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're better than that. You know, you're doing a terrible thing. So to answer your question, so both, it's like it, I felt guilty, but very quickly I became numb and mm. nothing mattered. Man, thank you so much uh, for that. I think it's so important as, as you know, the men on this, um, on this session, and then for all the, the watches that come after this, um, that they understand that it, it, when we reach that point of near apathy, that is a true red flag moment. You know, the Holy yeah. Spirit guilt is one thing, the satanic condemnation is a whole other thing, but that just numbed out, apathetic, going through the motions, that, that is the true red flag. I need some desperate help. And so, yeah. Speaking of that, what were some of the nuances of the industry that kind of pushed you to a rock bottom moment um, where, where you just said, this has all got to change? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, it was like compromise after compromise after compromise. And um, an additional factor was that people in that industry were beginning to die, mm -hmm. like via suicide or um, if, if you look at the data, it, it, it's just so bizarre. I mean, not even bizarre, but sad that like girl after girl after girl ends up in um, either D, like DUI that, you know, they, they crash and they, they end up dying or um, they end up getting killed, getting beat to death by a significant other. And it, because you end up in relationships where you're not being valued and you believe you don't have any value. So you stay there and you live your life as such because you're defined by your mistake. So your sin, your sin defines who you are and it, 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 and it defines how you live your life because you look at your future and you don't see one. So it's like, if, if I am worthless, why would I, why would I demand someone to treat me like I have worth? So mm -hmm. my expectation from you, is for you to abuse and take advantage of me. That's my expectation. So seeing the people that I knew, um, you know, because that was my world. I was working 25, 30 times a month. I did a thousand films in a six year period where the industry is essentially shuts down in December and January because award shows and stuff like that. So in a 10 month period for six years, I did a thousand movies. So I was pretty much on set you know, it, it minimum for about four or five days a week. So that was my whole life. And the, the copious amounts of just doing that time after time, after time, after time, it just chipped away at my soul because like, man, it's like, I wanted to do something else, but what, what the enemy wants you to do is you believe that hmm. there's no way out. And he wants to distract you from any other opportunity and wants to define your worth indicative of your behavior. And I truly believe, well, I'll never be a father. I'll never be a husband. There's what other occupation could I do? I don't have any value. I don't have any gifts or talents. How could I contribute to an organization? How could I lead someone? Um, that, that, that's, that's, that, sh that ship has sailed. My life is over. So the, the only thing that I could do was stay in the industry or like just hope that maybe I, I would build up my own production company or start directing because like literally I did not see a life, a career, a, anything outside of the four walls that was pornography because I didn't, I thought like, well, that's just who I was. Wow. It's, it's incredible how the lie can become the embodiment of your identity, which yeah. is the biggest lie to keep you within that sin you know and you have the the answers in front of you the the solutions in front of you but you don't believe you're worthy enough to partake or to step out that door uh into a different lifestyle and so it's like this self-fulfilling cycle uh of defeat it, it's so so terrible uh, so at some point uh you, you found yourself breaking out of that industry uh, yeah. how how did that happen obviously you started 
you mentioning about you know these these wake up moments for you where you started noticing people in the industry pass and uh, suffer yeah. these these afflictions. Um, you know, what was that transition like uh, for you? Yeah. Um, so I had this interaction at a bank where I was going to uh, deposit a check. And normally I would just do the Dropbox or ATM because the memo on the check said what it was for. And I didn't want to face the music because I, I was ashamed. I knew what I was doing. So um, there was this one day where like uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not super OCD, but it's just like, man, like something about like having a check on my person. It's like, get this out of my hand. It's like, it's gotta, it's gotta go somewhere. I'm going to lose it. So um, I, I go and I deposit this check. And after, after the transaction's over, you know, it's like, you know, do you, do you have your account number? No, swipe your card, yada, yada, yada. And at the end, after I, she slides the receipt across the, the counter to me and I pivot to go to walk away. And she says, Joshua, are you, are you doing okay? Joshua, can I help you? And, you know, with, with eye contact, which, which was huge because sex becomes so monotonous to me that I can do it with anyone, anywhere in front of no matter how many people yet looking someone in the eye and shaking their hand absolutely gave me chills because that was real. And she would look me in the eye and ask me if she, if I needed help. And I'm not sure what prompted her to do that. I believe it was, it was the Holy spirit. Um, but it shook me because what she didn't know is I had not heard my name spoken in over a year. And, um, it, 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 and it's, and it's kind of neat what my name means as well, but, um, it, like hearing my name, it, it shattered this plausible reality that was based on a lie and it, and it, and it kind of broke past this numbness and I felt the shame and I felt the weight of my guilt and even more so, I felt like, man, I have hurt my mom. Like, my mom's just desperately, like, reaching out to me. Like, she just wants to know if I'm okay. Like, she doesn't necessarily want me to, to leave and, and, and change my life. She just loves me and wants to know I'm okay. And I have allowed my shame to, to rob her from that. And, you know, a, after, you know, weeping and, and just looking in the mirror and just having a moment, like, I have no idea who's looking back at me in this mirror. I run, I run for my life. I run back home to mom. Um, and I get there and I'm like, okay, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, you know, on, on, on a whim, I had, I'd gotten like a, a personal training certification um, about a year prior. And it's like, well, that's my only option. Cause I, I that I, I, I don't have a resume that I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to walk into an organization and put my resume on the table and, and be hired. I don't want to be photographed or videoed in any capacity. And I, I seriously doubt anyone would have, would have done agreed to that anyway. But um, I just, so I run home to mom. I, I apply to a hundred different gyms and one gym ag agrees to hire me. And an, an important part of my story is that there was about a two, two and a half year gap in between when I left the industry and when I came to know Jesus and um it was hard like that was really hard because um what what happens often is like when you're in the middle of your sin like um i think uh eugene peterson says it really great i, I forget exactly how he words it but pretty much like when you're sinning like you you, you don't feel like a sinner and um it so it's like now there was just the, uh, you know, the, the, the lingering pain and the destruction due to my sin. So even I, so now I'm removed from, the, from that environment, but the fame and the money and the continuous praise masked the, the emotion. And now it was illuminated. But like the big thing for me was like the, the year that I left, I won performer of the year. And I thought like the money, the awards, the stuff like that. Like that will allow me to be happy. When I won that award, because I not I got nominated for it three times, and when I won it, when I was the best, you know, as an achiever, if I was the best, I would be happy. And it actually illuminated the brokenness in me because it didn't work. The money didn't work. Mm -hmm. The travel didn't work. 
every like man, like someone listening to me right now it's like man whatever it is that you think that on like that person has on instagram or that person has in your you know your neighborhood or or maybe in your family it's like the, a relationship a home a car a status a blue check mark whatever it is it doesn't fill the gap because that gap was made by god and it was for jesus and jesus alone and for me, it's like, man, it didn't work. And like, that's when like the depression, like really set in because like I had like outside looking in, I had everything you could ever want. So I leave the industry and now I'm just having night tears because now there's no one telling me I'm awesome. It's just like, I'm cleaning bathroom floors, like making, you know, $15 an hour. Um, and then, you know, re reality really set in when you know, I was making, I was making a lot of money and I was very irresponsible. Um, and I was living in a place that was very expensive. So I, I didn't do my taxes quarterly or, or even pay attention to them. And then I, I, and I got served that, that following spring for, you know, I, I'd made about like $365,000 the, the year prior. And I, and I didn't really have that much money and I was making maybe 40 grand. And, um, so I was like, what, whatever, like people ask me a lot, like, oh, like, you know, you, you probably still have like all this money. Like, do you, do you use the money that you made like from that, like for like church stuff? Like, oh, that's kind of messed up. I'm like, man, that money's long, long, long gone. Um, another question I get asked a lot about our residuals. Those don't, those don't exist, but kind of, it's kind of ask like, you know, where, where did I get there? How did I get to it? Kind of where I am now. So all that transpires. Um, I'm dealing with, you know, guilt and shame and uh, night tears and I'm working at this gym, but I'm like, okay, you know, the, the, the thing that my mom kind of embedded in me was like, love people and have great work ethic for good or for bad. You know, if I'm eating chicken wings, I'm going to eat the most, you know, for playing, you know, you know, what, whatever it is, whatever the game is, I'm the most competitive, I'm the worst loser. Um, and that's just kind of how I'm wired. And so it's like, I'm going to be the best trainer there's ever been. I'm going to be the best personal trainer in the world. Um, and then very quickly, I, I obtained a lot of success because I worked my butt off and I, and I, I have a gift to be able to go deep with people quickly. And I was just good at listening. I asked great questions and I listened and I helped people meet their needs. And I started like, okay, like I love pouring into people. I love teaching them things and then them bettering their lives this is amazing and i felt good about myself yet at night when i put my head on the pillow i'm still having the that recollection of, of who i used to be and very a lot of negative self-talk where it's like i will no matter what i do i'll always be that person and then this girl walks into the gym and i'm like i'm gonna ask her out on a date and i'm like hey um can i take you out to dinner and she said no <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> Um, I wasn't used to that. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Um, okay. And then she's like, well, I'll tell you what, um, you can meet me to go for a run. And it's like, man, I like to lift heavy weights and to like do sprints and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, don't ask we'll me skip to cardio run. days. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I like, I, I'll do like CrossFit and stuff like that. It's like, but um, like just to run a 5k it's like you know i would rather eat broken glass you know but i'm like yeah whatever i need to do to hang out with you i'm gonna do it and then we go on this we go on this run it very, very quickly turns into a walk but as i'm waiting on her to get there i i just had this like guilt it's like man along those lines so i, I painted the picture that there was a two-year gap because i lied to everyone i lied to everyone that i met i didn't want anyone to know what i did and there was a, there was another level of shame. Like I, I made up lies about what happened. Like I told people that my dad was dead. I told my people that my dad lived in a different country. And the reality is he lived three miles away from my mom, but I was ashamed. And, 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 and that's just how I lived for two years. Like, even though I was having success, like I was still a mess. And, um, we go on this run and I'm like, man, I can't hurt another person because there were people that I, I tried to like date or hang out with or have even a friendship with. And because I withheld pretty important information, especially like we're going to have a, a, a relationship. Um, I was like, I don't want to hurt this person. 
And that was the first time I felt like that in a long time. Because I don't want to hurt this person. So as the run turned into a walk, I'm like, hey, I want to tell you something. Um, I did a little bit of porn. She's like, what? What you what 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 what'd you say? And I was like, you know what? I was like, no, I'm not going to tell a partial truth. I'm not going to try to minimize it. I'm just going to tell the truth. And I told her everything. And after I told her everything, she was just like kind of looking at me like, okay, I didn't. And she's like, I did. I didn't expect for you to tell me that. Um, and then she kind of pauses, and then she looks me in the eye and says, I want you to know something. A person is not defined by the worst thing they've ever done. They're not defined by the greatest thing they'll ever accomplish. Each and every person is defined by God. Do you know who God is? And I was like, you know, I put on the mask, right? So, you know, I, I put on the first date mask. When you go on a date with someone for the first time, uh, more often than not, you're not yourself. You're the version of yourself that you believe that they want you to be because I, you know, you want to be liked, you want to be affirmed. So I put on the, I put on the mask of the Christian and I'm like, yeah. And, you know, I, I told her what I knew. I was like, yeah, I believe that God is real. I believe he created everything. I even believe that time, space, and matter came into existence at the same time. And there had to be a, a, an external, you know, existing, you know, intelligent being to, to have, you know, to be the catalyst for the force that created those things. Absolutely. Yes. And she's like, okay, that's great. Um, what, well, what's your relationship with Jesus like? Like, what, what, is, what is your walk like? Like, what does that look like practically in your life? And, and, I, and I went to lie, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't, I, it was like my throat was like closed. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell a lie. And, and I was just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I don't have an answer for that. And then she was like, well, um, I, I came to know Jesus, you know, as a teenager. This has been my life so far. It hasn't been perfect by any means. Um, but this is what my walk with Jesus is like. This is the church that I attend. This is, you know, um, this is where I do life. Um, and then just like a hard pivot to like normal conversation, which was shocking to me because like I thought for sure I was going to be degraded, disrespected. It, it, it meant minimum discarded like you know there's there's no way that that conversation was going to continue and um yeah it's like very like colossians 4 5 and 6 right so colossians 4 verses 5 and 6 right having wisdom and you know as you as, well, like walk with wisdom toward outsiders and in her speech was you know gracious her speech was gracious and I love I love the last part of that verse like you, you like to, to knowing how you ought to answer each person because Jesus was individual individualistic when you know he approached Nicodemus or the woman in the well you know he he, and he was great at asking questions to prompt critical thinking and wh that's what she did for me like she cultivated a curiosity and she conveyed you know a piece that I didn't understand and I was like how could she respond to what I said like that? And it kind of broke down some boundaries for me. And then, you know, we, we spend two hours walking and just talking about, you know, just normal things. You, you're just getting to know people. And then later that week, she's like, hey, do you want to go to, you want to go to church with me? I normally go to this one church, but um, a lot of people from the gym go to this, this other church. Um, you want to go check it out? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Like you, you've like, you, you've got my attention, you know, I'm like, I want to know more. And we go there, and when we walk in, you know, the, their mission statement is on this, like, really neat, like, stained wood um, thing. And it says, uh, our mission is to love people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And I was like, you want to love me where I'm at? I don't know. Like, you don't know me, bro. You don't know how broken I am. You don't know how dirty I am. Like, I don't know if that applies to me. And I'm pretty sure that I deserve death is what I deserve, like based on what I know. And uh, we walk in and everything's fine. Everyone's super kind. And um, but this pastor gets up there because I what, from my experience, you know, it's like if, if you don't if you don't have a three piece suit on, if you have a wrinkle in your shirt, you're going to hell, you know, like that. Like that's how I grew up. And um, this guy with, you know, uh, jeans and uh, like maybe like, you know, a, a button up. Uh, short sleeve shirt gets up there and 
uh, and it reminds me of my grandfather from, you know, we're, we're in Raleigh, North Carolina at this point, you know, deep, deep Southern accent. And he starts just talking about God and Jesus, like, you know, like that he's, he's buddies with Jesus and just like, like being like relatively casual. And then he starts talking about the story in first Samuel and he starts talking about my fellow chef and, and how um, the, the uniqueness of the relationship between David and Jonathan and how when Jonathan died, um, David became king. And just, just knowing historically, like the previous kingdom was wiped out, like everyone was killed. Yet David's saying, hey, um, is there anyone left in this family? And sought out Mephibosheth that assumed, knowing what he knew, like I deserve death. You know, I already, you know, if, if you read the story, you know, he, he was uh, may, maybe like some, some type of disability and it was dropped. So, you know, this guy's, you know, on, on you know, the, the corner, just sitting there, just waiting to be killed. And David sends a guard and he extends his hand, he extends grace to him. And he, he offers him a seat at his table, not for a day, not for a week, but forever and restores his land even. And, and then he pivots and he's like, and so much more does Jesus see you in the middle of your sin when you are deserving death. And, and actually, we all deserve death. You know, like Romans 3.23 tells us that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're all guilty. And if God is perfectly holy, not just that he's good, he's perfectly just. And if he's perfectly just, he does, that his wrath has to be fulfilled. How can it be fulfilled? Because everyone is imperfect and he, re, he requires perfection. How can that be? How can that be? And then it goes on. It's like, man, um, in Romans, it's talking about like Jesus died for us, not like not them like that we were good like Jesus didn't have good people and and he's talking and then it asks like the question like the rhetorical question like would you die for a good person like like maybe like a really good person like would you die for them it's like you know, like enemies of God Jesus looked at you while you were an enemy of Him and died for you was humiliated for you spat on for you died on the cross for you why because He loves you that much. And it was the only way. And like that, like leveled me because I was like, man, I didn't see myself deserving of love. And, 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 and what, it, what it untangled, right? Um, it's like, I, I'm not sure like how familiar everybody is with, with Greek, but like when, when I went through Greek, like Luo was the word that I, I, I learned to like 9,000 like tenses. Yeah. Like yeah. Luna was, was my word. And, um, but, but it means also like to untie, like from like Jesus' sandal being untied, but like to, to think about the like untangled, like that, that's something that really, that really, you know, I, that I clung, clung on to. It's like, I wanted Jesus to untangle the pain, the, the um, to untangle the, the web of lies that I've told myself for so long. And in that moment, all of a sudden, it was just entangled enough where I could actually see the father for who he was. And the, the father that I was always longing for, I had. And, you know, that love washed over me and that, that, sh that the, the shame and the guilt was removed from me and not just from doing porn, from my whole life. Like, I, I, I didn't feel valuable my whole life. And in that moment, I felt love. And I felt seen and I felt known. And in and, and the, and the beautiful part of that story, like, yes, like in, in that moment, I gave my life to Christ. But what I love, and I, this is why I preach on Colossians 4, like probably too much, but just that interaction, because how you interact with people matter, because you never know what one act of obedience, how small it changed the trajectory of someone's life. But, you know, that, that, that person that I went on that walk on, that, that asked me if I knew about God, and she responded with grace. And her, and her words were seasoned with salt. Um, she's been my wife for almost six years, and, and we have three kids together, and we do ministry together. And um, it's, it's like, like that's kind of how I got to, um, to, to that point in my life. And, and that was um, a, a little over, like going on eight years ago. Wow. And that, that is incredible, yeah. Joshua. Thank you so much, man. That is that is so inspirational. As I'm watching the chats just roll in, and I, and I hope that you have an opportunity to see some of this feed sometime. I'm going to forward all this to you. 
uh, from the chat that, that we'll yeah. capture at the end, just because of the blessings that I think that you're providing for these guys. Um, and I know you're not, you know, hanging your hat on this or anything to say, you know, whoa, look at me. I know this is because of what God did for you, period. It's a natural, normal yeah. response. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like that. But, I mean, that's why I want to tell, that's why I want to tell my story with so much clarity and so much vulnerability, because it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to illuminate sin. I'm trying to point to Jesus. Yeah. And um, like, for me, it's like, I, I, I love to teach on Peter, you know, it's like Peter, um, you know, Jesus called Peter out of being a fisherman and, you know, you're, you're going to be a fisher of men and you, you are the, the person I'm going to build my church on. You're the rock, you know, that you know, Peter was the OG rock, you know? Um, and, you know, and, and then we have Peter's like, man, I'm never going to, I'll never deny you, Jesus. I got your back. And then he does not once, not twice, but thrice. And, you know, even looking him in the eyes and then Jesus, you know, comes back and retorts, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then we, then we land. I love um, just the perspective this provides in Acts 3, where Peter is, pe is preaching to a Jewish audience. And he's saying, you denied Jesus. You crucified Jesus. And so did I. And I'm preaching with such zeal and passion because I betrayed Jesus too. I denied him too, and I know what it cost me. So I say that to say, I want you to turn from your sins and turn to him because he is the only way. And I say that with passion in my voice because I've been there. And that's why I tell my story with passion and zeal because, man, I don't want one person to experience what I did. And I want everyone to experience the love of God. That's amazing. Amen. Well, you know, spoiler alert. I mean, you, you've moved on now. I mean, you, you mentioned the three kids are all underneath four years old. Um, you, you're yeah. now C, you're chief operating officer for a a, a faith based you know social media development uh, company called Blessed Media. You know, yeah. thank you so much for for you know your pastoral efforts and what you're doing uh, in that realm, and also for what you're doing with Blessed Media, what you've done here today. Uh, I want to kind of ease into some questions, and this has to do with the kids, really. You know, yeah. what do you think as we take a look at the future here? We know that it keeps getting younger and younger and younger, where kids are getting snagged into porn. Yeah. All right. So from your perspective, how do we better keep these kids from, from falling into that trap? Yeah, I mean, uh, John, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And it, 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 in part of loving me is, uh, is, is treating truth with trust. So it, when, I, when I talk to my kids, it's like, don't touch the stove. My kids don't know if the stove is hot because they trusted me when I told them not to touch it. So if we don't tell people the truth, we're not operating in love. And sometimes we, we need to tell people the truth and it's difficult conversations. And for some reason, um, the, the, the church as a whole um, ha, has stopped or, or, or straight away from in some capacity talking about difficult things. Because the moment that I surrender my authority as a father or as a follower of Jesus or as a pastor um, to my church, if I'm not the one speaking from the authority of the the inerrant and the infallible word of God, if I'm not the one speaking that truth, I'm surrendering it to the world. And now I'm playing catch up. So in, in every capacity, like the, the, the Bible is truth. So why would we not tell people the totality of truth? Like, obviously, you know, there, there's things to navigate through, like how old children are, but we're called to protect them. And protecting them is not not saying things because it might be a difficult conversation for you because it's not about you. It's about them. So if you get right in the face because they ask you questions, you don't know the answer to love them enough to say, um, you know, let's, let's figure this out together. Or if someone asks you a question that you don't know the answer to like, like just good apologetics, right? I'm not, I'm not called to give you an answer. I'm called to ask you a great question. So collectively, you can figure out the answer. And if I can guide you there, praise God. So um, I think that's so important. It's so important yeah, for us yeah. to talk about um, what is true and, and not bend on that. Yeah, that's a great way to teach kids is to engage them in the process and not necessarily just be monologuing to them. This is what you should do. This is what you should do, right? right? right. But engage them, like, you know, hear their thought process and how they see things, what they have questions about, right? You want to be that authority in that area. Because uh, if not, yeah, so I mean, yeah, the, the world, they're going to be happy to indoctrinate the kids with what they think is best for them in terms of, you know, and sexuality and all that stuff. So that's that's great feedback, man. Thank you so yeah, much. I mean, just 
like just just thinking about like westernized culture it's like like that's why like discipleship making like takes a hit because uh, we we want you know instantaneous information. We want to know it now. We want to do it now. And discipleship making takes time. So if I'm not cultivating a desire in people to have an independent dependency on Jesus, then mm. they're never going to have a dependency on Jesus. So if if I don't teach my kids collectively, like it, it like you were saying, it has to be a conversation, not monologue, because that's not being loving. I'm just telling you my opinion. If I tell you what to do. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, and that's, that's a great response. I mean, just to go on, on to another question here that we've got, uh, someone was asking, how do you shed the old self and kind of bring in the new self? Obviously, we know we all go through this process of sanctification and we all have different backgrounds and stories. And at times the enemy can kind of come in here and there and try to, you know, cast that condemnation and those fiery darts at us, you know, uh, sometimes even when we're rock bottom and low. Uh, how, yeah. how, what's your response or how, how do you combat that and continue to walk faithful? Yeah. I mean, uh, number one, I mean, second Corinthians five seventeen is real. It's like that person is dead. Um, so like, like that's a truth that I need to cling on to. And, and again, um, I can't talk about this enough. It's like, that's why it's so important for you to know your Bible because whatever is in you when pressed, that's what's going to come. That's what's going to come out of you. So um, for me, I remind myself with truth. I remind myself what Romans 8, 1 says, right? And so there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So like, that's who I am. Like, I'm a child of God. I'm redeemed. I am restored. I am worth dying for, you know, the, 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 the creator of the world that breathed the world into existence saw me and believed that I was worth dying for. So if, if that's my value, then I'm not going to allow, uh, an, an, you know, an antagonistic comment or an intrusive thought to, to lead me in that direction. And again, let's, I know your Bible, right? Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So it's like, like, that's how, but like from, from start to finish, like practically, like, man, I, I need to go to counseling. I need to take inventory of my life. What am I allowing into my life? Like, what am I listening to? What am I consuming? Um, who am I following on social media? You know, go through that list, take inventory. Is it leading you in the direction that you want to go? If it's not, it needs to go. Even maybe it's for a short period of time where you need to be really drastic. Maybe you need to delete some apps. Maybe you need to get off social media altogether. But like, if you're not doing that, you're not going to get the result that you want. And then you need to set boundaries. Again, like back to the stove. It's like, I set the boundaries for the stove. Why? Because I love my kids. God loves you. So he puts boundaries in your life so that you won't get hurt. But when I try to create my own autonomy, I get hurt. So it's like, I need to run back to my father, check myself before I wreck myself. You know, that, that like, that's, that's what we need to do. Um, so for me, like, yeah. So a process, take inventory of my life, set boundaries. Um, and then uh, the me, for me, it's like, man, ha have someone in your life that you can have hot, conversations with so honest open and transparent because for me i needed someone in my life that could call me out on my crap and encourage me and it's like if you are someone who when you receive critical feedback and out of love and if, if you push back from that that's your pride and your pride will will pause your progress your pride will pause your your progress because when you hear man um you you shouldn't have said that and if you push that back it's like man you're missing out on growth because i love you and i see i see a flaw in your life and i love you enough to tell you because that that's being loving you know if you had broccoli in your teeth that i didn't and i didn't tell you that's not being very loving right so if you're if you're talking to your kids or your wife in a way that's not appropriate um I, you know that's, that's probably coming from a space of of anger and maybe there's something you need to deal with so I love you enough to say, hey, man, um, I, I, saw, I saw you acting in a way that that's not you. Is there something going on in your life? And, and having people that can call you out and people that can cheer you on, like that's how you win. Wow, that's, that's good feedback. And the uh, chat is, is uh, buzzing over here with your acronym for HOT. Uh, I haven't heard that before myself. I was even jotting it down. Honest, open, transparent conversations. I love that, man. That's, and really the process is simple, right? But I think we tend to overcomplicate it at times for what we need to do to get back on track or continue to pursuing the right track. 
Uh, no. It's really simple, practical things. And a lot of times we know what yeah, we have to do. We just don't do it, right? Because it's probably too emotionally, mentally, or spiritually hard or difficult. But that's what we need to do, right? In order yeah. to be able to overcome and put to death the yeah. old man. So Yeah, exactly. And it's like John, John 19, 30 said, you know, like the, one of one of Jesus' last words before he, he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished, right? So tell the test. I, he, said, he said it is finished. So what that means is if I am in Christ, then sin no longer has any hold on me, but I can get distracted and my identity, my identity can get distracted or, you know, like, like the enemy, he can't steal your gifts and talents and abilities from you, but he can distract you into you not using them because you, you question your worth. So for me, it's like what I want to encourage people with, it's more important to be consistent than to be perfect. Like consistency, like literally anything in life, like the gym, reading your Bible, um, you know, growing in your relationship with Christ, consistency, consistency is the key. So being consistent and understanding you know, through the lens of John 19, 30, if I fall, I don't have to start over. If I fall, like if, if you're struggling with, you know, watching pornography. And, and you and you're taking steps you're moving forward you're you're you know you're 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 you've you've set some boundaries in your life you set some safeguards um and then you slip up that doesn't mean that you're who you used to be but we need to be in a place where we're failing forward right we're failing forward and i and i have the, the spiritual maturity to say not man I shouldn't have done that. Ask the question, why did I say yes? Why did I say yes to that compromise that I fought so hard against? Because if I can get to the root, I can prevent that. Or if it's, it was something as simple as like, I shouldn't have looked at that. You know, the Bible doesn't say be strong and man up. It says run. <laughs> it says to flee. You know, like learn from Joseph. It's like, man, um, he was smart enough to run. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's just knowing like you're you're not perfect. You never will be. So if we mess up along the way, know that there's grace for you, and and God doesn't love you anymore. If if your your you know you version Bible streak is at a hundred or you masturbated yesterday, God doesn't love you any less. But He wants you to grow. He wants you to grow. He wants you to come to know Him. He wants He wants to remove that shame and that guilt for your life. But if you do stumble along the way, pick yourself up and dust yourself off and know that there's grace for you and keep moving forward because that's how you progress. Like that's how that behavior is completely eradicated from your life through consistency from a deep work over time and being consistent and having people in your life where you could say, I messed up and someone someone doesn't condemn you. But they say, man, what made you say like what made you do that? And then having the trust and the love to have a healthy conversation about that so that it doesn't happen again. Amen. Amen. Thank man. Thank you just for this, this whole session. Um, as I see the chat just rolling in, I see guys that maybe they struggle with sexual sin, sexual stronghold in their past, but that's, that's just such a, a great application for anybody that's tied up with alcohol, with drugs, with pride, yeah. with power, with looking for the money, looking for that, that, that dollar sign event you know, in their bank account that triggers them to walk away from work, the, the comfort security, whatever that looks like, that distraction you're talking about. Because really in the end, it is a distraction from the finished work of the cross. And we're trying to fill ourselves with some other it. Hmm. And so, and by the way, I'm really flat footed uh, this whole session. Joshua, obviously you, you demonstrate an incredible command of the Bible. And I so appreciate it, man. One of the questions that we had was, you know, what are some of your go-to scriptures? Um, so for all the men that, that, that may be thinking that, just replay this off the Facebook site or on the, on your podcast yeah. and just start scribbling yeah. stuff down because they came kind of machine gun style. Yeah. Uh, there's a ton of yeah. them there and I, I know I'll be going back and revisiting it. Um, but guys, thank y'all yeah, so like much. My, Go ahead. I was, gonna say, I, was just, I was just like, what, like one of my favorite verses, like John 16, 33, right? So I told you these things. So the in me, you can have peace. So peace is not available because of you. Peace is available because of him in this world tribulation will happen trials will happen things will happen you will fail people will hurt you you will hurt people 
Um, things will happen that you don't understand. The world is evil. You will see depravity, but you can take heart. You can be of good courage because he has overcome the world. So what I love about that is like we, we as men, it's like, you know, either I'm the guy or I'm not. Courage is found in a person, yeah. not inside of yourself. Mm -hmm. and, it, and you have access to as much of it as you choose to take in. Man, that's incredible. Um, wow. I, one last closing question, if I may. Um, sure. From someone, obviously, who came from the industry and is now on the flip side of that, now sharing the gospel, helping men be set free, sharing the truth. Um, what advice would you give to everybody here who's watching to how we can get involved, not only in our own personal walks of healing, but how can we combat and be on the offensive uh, for this next generation um, and combating the porn industry? Like, what, do you, what are some things that we could do uh, to be engaged in that fight um, that you think would be effective? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, the, the most beneficial thing you can do if you want to combat pornography is create the grace and the space for people who are struggling with it to have conversations about it because they believe that they're alone and they believe that they're dirty and they believe that they're stuck. But the reality is, is they don't have to stay where they are. And today they can choose to move in a different direction. But, you know, how can people know if you don't tell them? So I, I think like that comes in part of like just loving people well, where it's like, um, I, I, I love this, like, this like, thought process where it's like, man, if you see something that needs to be done more often than not, God's calling you to do it where it's like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, that, that would be neat if that happened. It's like, well, wh why, don't, why don't you do it? And I, I think like, yeah, like a, a practical way is to um, are you like, are you in a small group that you've been in a long time and you're in that small group because you're comfortable like, are you growing or, or is that just really like a hangout with your buddies? Because mm. that's different and that's great, but it's different. So maybe God is calling you to start a small group for men in your age demographic, because when you, when you, when you create the grace and space for someone to show up and to be consistent in their life in a world of chaos, all of a sudden you get to, to, to operate in a, in a place where like, maybe you didn't intend to like do that. But you're going to be someone who can, uh, gosh, I forget the quote. It's from uh, Master of Evangelism. It's like people are looking for a demonstration, not an explanation. So if you can demonstrate the love of God to someone, man, like, that's how you impact people. Amen. That's solid. Amen. Yeah, you know, pe people don't really care about our theological backgrounds, to be honest. They care about what Christ did in our lives and yeah. how we can relay yeah, I mean, that. I mean, that, that again, it's like I could talk about this all day long, but man, when it comes to like westernized culture, like it, it, if we could get our head around, it's more important to be theologically competent than theologically eloquent. Like man, oh man, what a world it would be. Yeah, that's Amen. good. So. Awesome guys. Well, um, Joshua, thank you so, so much for being on here with us. Thank you for opening up your heart and your story uh, for all the great advice, for regurgitating all this great scripture to us and, and uh, showering us with God's truth man uh you're a blessing uh we want to take a second here to just close out and pray unless you had some other announcements or things you wanted to cover before we close sure yeah marcos is going to close out here in prayer in a second man i just want to uh, i want to thank you for being here you know none of this runs if you're not here i still see almost all the guys st stuck around through the one hour mark which is kind of tough to do a lot of guys are in a professional environment and maybe they're running out of time and so I, i'm just thrilled um, as we went over that it's just it's just an incredible outpouring here so next month may 13th friday i know some people are a little bit scared of that okay don't be it's going to be a blast i promise it's the next mission brief we do it every second friday of the month at 1 p.m eastern um i i can only imagine <laughs> how quickly we're going to try and ask joshua to come back uh, we still have some, some some further questions we still have some some further thirst i'll be honest i know i do uh, just about what God's doing in his life, you know, especially in the professional realm now. And then, and then also what's going on with him uh, from a marital standpoint, a, a co-ministry standpoint with his, his beautiful wife and his, his incredible kids. So uh, thanks again, Joshua. We appreciate it. Marcos, would you mind closing us out in prayer, brother? Absolutely, absolutely. Father, we thank you so, so much for this amazing testimony. Lord, your word says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And Lord, we thank you for encouragement. We thank you for 
uh, the sharing of your truth and your scripture, Lord God. I pray it has blessed each and every single one of the men here in attendance today. Lord, bless Joshua, bless his ministry, bless his family. Continue to guard and protect him, Lord. Continue to provide increase there for uh, the proliferation of your truth through his testimony, Lord, to be glorifying to you, to be impactful to millions of men worldwide. And uh, Father, may you be glorified in this session. And we're just so grateful and so thankful, God. And we just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, for Amen. folks that are still sticking around here, this will be available on the Soul Refiner Facebook site. Um, if you do not have a divorce book account, uh, that's what I've heard some people call it before, um, or if you need to use your, your wives, um, I, I get it. Uh, if you want to hear audio only, that's going to be on Amazon Music. We'll post that as well. Uh, also, Spotify will be a place where we hang the audio podcast version of this. So it is available uh, for us to lather, rinse, repeat in. Um, and then I'll be answering a lot of these chat questions that we couldn't get to uh, throughout the next week. So thank you again, Joshua. Love you already, Absolutely. man. Barely know you. I right, love you guys. See you, man.